Do you know, it's, it's strange because we, with that journey that Martin's just shared, it does feel like we're very much a part of your journey um, all those many years back. And I remember when Terry um, called us over and said, I've just, God's really spoken to me in South Africa, in Bloemfontein, he was standing on a podium um, about to speak to a group of leaders when God spoke to him and said, plant a church in Lansing, which then obviously became um, Jubilee Church, um, you guys have been planted out of Jubilee Church and Redeemer, the whole, the, the whole thing, there's this incredible synergy. And as we were worshipping, I was just feeling like, it feels like we've, we, we went away and we were involved in getting um, what is now Gateway Church Swindon started, um, along with another man called Andrew Meakey, and uh, many years ago, and then planted into Gloucester. And it feels like we were sent off on a mission somewhere, and now we have permission to come home. And that's what it feels like. It feels like we've got permission to come home. And, uh, and we have three children who live in Worthing, very grown up now, um, with their own families, so our grandchildren are there as well. Um, and the grandson that lives with us, um, he's just moved from Gloucester to Worthing as well. He's gonna have to change his accent um, because he is very broad West Country. <laughs> so, but um, it does feel an absolute joy to be back here um, it's slightly premature on our, our original plans. We thought maybe we would we, retire back here one day, but um, we were just asked if we would bring those forward to come and give support to Redeemer, to Joel, to see what God wants to do. Um, I'm really looking forward to building a relationship with Martin and Tanya and, uh, and just hope that we have a friendship going forward. I just, just long for him. Just found myself in the worship time just feeling so connected and and you know you can go anywhere in the world can't you with people that you don't know but yet the moment you open your mouth and worship you are family um, doesn't matter what language that's in doesn't matter what culture you're doing that with your family immediately and uh, and it's just an amazing amazing thing all because of jesus what was that that wonderful hymn i've never sung that hymn before it's incredible just love that it was just so full of magnificent truth and all because of Jesus, because he's in us and through us. And I've noticed, actually, I've been watching some of your videos um, over the last weeks, just to get to know you a little bit, I suppose. It's just a nice way to do that. And I've noticed, um, I've really been thrilled to see that you're going through a series, looking at Jesus, looking at various aspects of Jesus. And, and I'm thrilled by that, I really am, because I think so often we, we can talk about culture, we can talk about all sorts of different things, but... When it comes down to it, we need to connect with Jesus in a fresh, vibrant, wonderful way that empowers us for the life that's ahead of us. I mean, after all, after all, who wouldn't want to spend time with the one who has the highest authority in the universe? Who wouldn't want to spend time with the one who causes all other names and authorities to bow their knee and confess that he is Lord? Who wouldn't want to do that? And, uh, and so I'm thrilled um, that's been part of the journey over the last weeks. And so I, wanted to, I also wanted to dip into that a bit, actually, and just bring another perspective, if I can, just briefly in the time that we have this morning. And, uh, and I want to turn, you, turn your attention to Acts chapter 4. Um, and uh, let me just read to you a little bit of this. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I just wanted to set a bit of a context, and I'm going to dip into different verses as we go through. But Acts chapter 4, uh, let me just read it to you, then I'll give you context. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. That's some, that's some mission trip, isn't it? <laughs> Incredible. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas and John and Alexander, Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they'd set them in the midst, they inquired, uh, by what power? Or by what name did you do this? And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to the rulers of the people and elders, 
If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man was being healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Extraordinary passage, and I'm going to dip into that in just a moment. But I want to go back and set the scene a bit. Why was all this commotion there in the first place? Well, if you go back to chapter 3, you will notice that um, Peter and John were approaching the gate of the temple and uh, where they came across a guy that was, who was lame. Now, I'm assuming he'd been there for quite some time. Probably he was, everyone knew him. They're probably so familiar with him, they passed him by day after day as he was asking for financial support. Um, and uh, so this guy was there, Peter and John, now so full of the Holy Spirit, come up to the temple and the guy reaches out his hands and he's really looking for some financial support. And, uh, and Peter and John said, um, listen, I, I don't have anything to offer you right now. In fact, what they say is, silver and gold I do not have. But in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. You see... What Peter said to him was, he said, I don't have money. Uh, I don't have anything else. I don't have a solution to your problem. I don't have what you think you need. I don't have the medical uh, nous to bring some solution to your crippled state. But I do have something. He says, I have a name. I've got a name. I have a name to which every power must bow. He said, I have a name, it's been entrusted to me, and that every power must bend its knee in confession that this name, this person, this Jesus, is the Lord. I have a name. And so Peter uh, declares it over the lame man, and the result is he starts walking and leaping and praising God. He proclaimed Jesus over him. He just received an absolute transformation in his own personal life in the name of of Jesus. You see, because of Jesus' conquest on the cross, and on, at, 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 in the cross and on the grave, and because he now has the highest seat in heaven, he has now the final authority over all things. And so often, I love that testimony this morning of the, of the, of the light. Uh, it's lovely. So often, we are trying to find all sorts of other solutions. But we have a name. Martin said, you know, those who are unwell, God will heal. Because we have a name. And right now, I, I mean, I've, I've suffered over the years. I'm a type 1 diabetic. I sadly had a stroke back in 2015, which thankfully God brought me through. But I've discovered over the years that I'm alive because there is a name that is a name above every name. Yeah. And I trust that name. Now remember, I'll tell you this very brief story, so I'm just going to dive, I'm going to go away from the notes for a minute. During that year of 2015, I had a minor stroke, and so there was a lot of recovery that had to be done. But also during that year, I started getting a kidney problem. And uh, I was taken into hospital, I was scanned and all the rest of it, and they had that horrible moment when um, someone comes to your bedside, pulls the curtains around and said, um, we've got the results of your examination, we've found a growth in your kidney and it's not stones, it's about four centimetres. Um, and then suddenly you get telephone calls from your GP surgery, don't you, saying, um, we just want to check to see how you are, and, and you can get fast-tracked through the process because they're concerned that this is cancer or a tumour, and they don't do biopsies on kidneys, they just remove the kidney. And so um, I was due to have another scan and, um, and then meet with the consultant to, um, to, to see what would, what would they would do next. But the church came together to pray. And uh, I stood there in this prayer meeting and I was like, Lord, I just want to encounter you. And I heard a voice to the right of me saying, all Mark needs to do is to tell Jesus what he wants. 
And I thought, hmm, good point. I don't know what to say. So my prayer, and I can genuinely say this, my prayer was, Lord, if through this process of carrying an infirmity in my body, I get to know you, then I'll gladly walk the process. If I get to know you through healing, I'll gladly be healed. But Lord, all I want is to know you. And I felt this wave of faith come over me. Anyway, we then went to the, had the scan and went to the doctor uh, for the results. And um, we sat in, his, sat in the consultant's room and, and he says, okay, you've got a bit of a challenge. And he put up two images um, on the scan results. On the one, you could see the, the four centimeter growth. And he put up the second one, it wasn't there, gone. And, uh, and so Maria, um, because she's a mighty woman of faith, said, so how do you think that's happened then, doctor? It was, it was a leading question. Uh, she, she didn't want to know the answer, she knew the answer, it was a leading question. How do you think that's happened? And he said, not sure. And she said, I do. The church prayed, and now it's gone. And um, it's the, we have a name. Yeah. It's above every name, it's quite extraordinary. Anyway, sorry, I've, di I've digressed. I'll jump over to chapter four. Because now what we have is, they, this incredible miracle has happened. The lame man is now walking in the name of Jesus, praising God. Because he was so well known, everybody is caught up in that moment. And it says that 5,000 people were added. There was a miracle, and salvation came with the miracle. Incredible. And so Peter and John are now brought before the religious leaders, and they're being rebuked, and they've been imprisoned because of this name, Jesus. So, let's be clear to start with, before going into this. If you look at verse 12, Peter makes it very clear. He said, listen, there's no other name under heaven by which someone must be saved. No other name. See, we're not working with multiple options here. We're not looking for some maybe combined gesture of heavenly stuff to find a way to some kind of eternal reality. There is only one way. And contrary to public, uh, popular belief, all roads do not lead to Rome <laughs> in this sense. There is just one way to eternal life, that is through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so Peter is making this very clear to the rulers and to the elders, and these guys had some authority. And if you then look in verse 13, it says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived they were uneducated, untrained men. They marveled and they realized they'd been with Jesus. This was important because they couldn't quite figure out why these fishermen had such authority. And then they wound it forward and they said, well, the only thing we can work out is they'd been with Jesus. You see, it was recognized that not only do they speak in the name of Jesus, but they speak as those who spent time with him. And this is actually really important. So I want to suggest to you this morning Spending time devoting your life to Jesus as in every way possible as a daily reality more than compensates for any weaknesses or deficiencies we think we may have as the people of God. You may say, what impact can we possibly have on Little Hampton? You have a name. What impact can we have? You have a name. You have incredible potential and impact on Littlehampton because you have a name. And as devoted followers, robust followers of Jesus Christ, there is nothing that you can't do in his name. Now, that's not grand speak. That is truth. That's reality. And we need to press into that reality more and more. The resurrection of Jesus has opened a way for us to do and walk in extraordinary blessings of heaven and distribute that to our communities here in Littlehampton, in Worthing, in Gloucester, or wherever we may find ourselves. So follow me here. In verse 18, it says, They called them and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. Notice they commanded. They didn't suggest. This just wasn't just a, well, it's a bit irritating, guys. This was a command. You will not speak in the name of Jesus anymore. They, they, they set in place an injunction. 
In other words, we're not going to allow you to do this, so we're going to set this in place, and if you do, we're, we're, going, to, we're going to come back and, and uh, arrest you again. These people have authority. Their command was clear. You are to no longer speak in this name. Now, I think it's interesting. You know, Jesus, the preaching carpenter, uh, or preaching carpenter's son, didn't offend anybody until he started demonstrating power. And also, he didn't offend anyone until he started making a pronouncement that you must forsake all to follow me. And suddenly, his name is offensive to people who think there are multiple ways to God. It's only the power and the proclamation. If he'd just gone about his business, and yeah, he, he could have had some wisdom, he could have just spoken freely in the, in the marketplace without power, there were lots of wise sages around at the time doing it, but because he had divine power, he created offence. It's important for us to understand that. Because I would suggest we often get to talk about God or the church, and we only get a mild reaction to that. So you might, you might introduce people to the subject, of, um, of uh, when you go to church, what do you, you know, you go to work and I say, what do you do over the weekend? Oh, Sunday, we went along to a Christian gathering and uh, we met at, uh, at the school, uh, which I can't remember the name of the school, we got lost coming here, so that's probably why we got lost. And um, you'll get no reaction. Maybe, oh, that's good, I went to watch the football. But boy, the, oppos the opposition would kick in if you say, I went to worship Jesus. I'm a devoted follower of Jesus. There's, a, there's something that kicks in when you move from simply a passive context of we go to church or meet with, a, meet with a group of Christians to I'm a devoted follower of Jesus. Something happens. You know, you can talk to your neighbour about, about believing in God. And they might just come back to you and say, well, yeah, I'm a, I'm a believer in God. The world is full of God-fearers but the world is not full of followers of Jesus. Many people will fear God, but which God are they fearing? <laughs> you know, you can, it's, I find, I, the reason I love that hymn, so often I'm a bit of a, bit of a nerd when it comes to this. I think sometimes I'll worship, um, sometimes I'll worship songs, I, I could sing to my wife. They're not telling me anything about Jesus. They're opening my heart up, yes. And sometimes the worship songs that we sing, what have been created, um, are rather broad in as much as we're worshipping God. Well, probably any religion could pick one of those songs up and sing it. I love the ones that declare the majesty of Christ. Because that, that, that belongs to us. We have a name. That belongs to us. If you tell your neighbour you're a devoted follower of Jesus, you'll get an altogether, altogether different response than just telling them you believe in God or you go to church. In 1 Peter 2.8, we're introduced to Jesus as the cornerstone, aren't we? And uh, he's the cornerstone of all that is to come. And, uh, and the church is built on that, from that cornerstone, on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, but it also goes on to say he's also known as a stumbling, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offence. Many years ago, I will tell this, many years ago, I was preaching the gospel in the centre of Worthing, where Woolworths used to be, you know, just that bit there. And I was, I was talking to this lady, and it was one of the most absurd reactions I've ever seen in my life. I was talking to this lady and saying, I'm a Christian, go to this church, etc., um, etc., et and uh, she, oh, that's good, that's lovely, yeah, 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 happy to see that you're a pious kind of a person. And I said, do you know Jesus? It was the kind of question you asked in those days when you were doing street work. Do you know Jesus? The reaction, her face, had just completely changed. She looked furious, and she literally did this. She grabbed the hem of her skirt and ran down the road. I've never seen anything quite like it. There was, a, there was a conflict with darkness and light. Jesus brings about, brings about a reaction. He becomes a stone of stumbling. But he also becomes the cornerstone on which the universe is built. Look at the response of Peter and John in verse 19. Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it's right in the sight of God to 
listen to you more than to God you judge. And then here's the verse. We cannot help but speak the things we have seen and heard. We cannot help it. Can I ask you this morning, can you help it? Is it an option? Are you able to turn it on or turn it off? If you can turn it on and off, then may I suggest that maybe we need another glimpse of Jesus. Maybe we need to listen to him again, the eternal, perfect will of God. See, the greatest reality in the universe is the presence of the resurrected Christ. And to fill my heart and mind with all other inferior things and not with the power of his resurrection gives me an option. Turn it on, turn it off. I can turn the message on and I can turn the message off. It becomes optional. If it's optional, then maybe we've not seen or heard Jesus the way we should. You know, I love the old hymn. I'm a bit of an old hymn fan, I must admit. When I survey the wondrous cross. And then it says in one, one of the verses, Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. Peter and John said, We cannot help but speak what we have seen and heard. My friends, we're living without options in the Christian faith. My invitation to you today is it's time to sign up again for a life that has no options. And that's produced through your devotion to Jesus. See, we're designed for the Lord for this hour. We're designed for this. We've been prepared throughout our entire lifetime. It matters not if you have a lifetime of shipwrecks, of failing God. It doesn't matter one little bit. What matters is everything up to this point is a tool used by God to make you and me a more of a righteous influence and witness in the earth. It must be said by the people of God, we cannot help but speak of the things we've seen and heard. It is no longer an option. And I pray that God removes the option for us this morning. As I'm sharing this, there are some other things I wanted to share about the attitude of Peter and John and their boldness and how they went on to pray. When they got released, they went back to their friends and said, this is what's happened. They all lifted their voice. Oh God, oh God. And what did they pray? They prayed, God, give us all boldness. So the boldness that got them into trouble, they said, we want more of what got us into trouble. And I won't go into all of that now, but we don't really have time. And I don't want to lose, I think, where we are right this second. But I will say this. In Acts 1, it tells us that when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon us, we are witnesses. We have power to witness. Now, I will say, it doesn't take the anointing of the Spirit to tell your neighbour you're a Christian. It doesn't take the anointing of the Holy Spirit to give a sandwich to a hungry person. These things are expected. This is what we do. So our witness and the power of the Spirit is to demonstrate and to magnify the resurrection of Christ. That's what our witness is for. It's not so that I've got a greater ability to talk to my neighbour. It's not. That takes boldness. It takes courage. But if we want the end result of our boldness and courage, we need the anointing of the Holy Spirit to take it further so that the individual we're speaking to witnesses the resurrection of Christ. This is what this is about. That's what we're witnesses of. We're witnesses of the resurrection of Christ. And so if I speak to my neighbour, or if I go to someone who is unwell, I want to, I, I want to be able to preach the gospel and share faith, 
Belief in miracles as a demonstration that Jesus was raised from the dead. That's the, that's the reality of the gospel, is it not? That we're demonstrating Jesus being raised from the dead. And because he's been raised from the dead, as I said right at the beginning, we now have a name. It is above every name. I cannot help but speak of what I have seen and what I have heard. Is that where we are today? I've got to say, I've fallen, foul, fallen down on this so many times when an op opportunity comes. You go, oh, I'm a bit nervous. I don't know. Supposing they dislike me. Supposing they reject me. Supposing they never speak to me again. I was really moved by something that happened to Maria just recently. And I've, I've used this a couple of times in different places, so forgive me, honey, for this. She, she was at a, a family do, and uh, during that family do, one of the family members was sat chatting with her. And Maria isn't going to be in your face, horrible, kind of obnoxious Christian who just wants to you know, find every opportunity to bash you, you know, repent or perish, you heathen. Um, she's not like that. But in this conversation, this person just stopped and looked at her and says, could you for once take the night off from being a born-again Christian? Maria's response wasn't these words, but the way she responded was, I cannot help but speak of what I've seen and heard. I have a name. It's the name above every other name. Where are we today? I, I trip up so many times, but I've also known some magnificent times when you follow that process through and what is at the end is an extraordinary miracle. I, 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 there was one, I, I, was in, I was in Bombay, Mum, Mumbai now, but it was Bombay then, and we were preaching and preaching the gospel and we were crowded gathered around us and I'd been preaching that Jesus heals the sick. And this man grabbed me from the crowd and pulled me out and said, you come, you come, you come. And I thought, ah! I'm terrified. God, give me all boldness. Now just get me out of here. Took me off down this track, down this uh, um, narrow street, down a corner, around another corner. I thought, I'm, gonna, I'm just about to get lynched or something. And he took me into a house, and there was a lady laying on a bed. You pray, he said. And she was obviously out. She was asleep, or she was not able to wake up. He showed me a growth in her stomach that was you could see that you could see the shape in her stomach so you pray oh lord and that's when you need the power of the holy spirit you don't need the power of the holy spirit to speak to your neighbor you need the power of the holy spirit for when you get to this point and so i put my hand i had no idea what to pray all i knew was i had a name i said in the name of the jesus in the name of jesus i command you to go and in that moment, my hand literally flattened underneath. It flattened underneath, and it was gone. She didn't wake up at that moment. He was absolutely, ah, what's going on, what's happened? And uh, then I stepped into kind of, um, <coughs> we have a meeting tonight, and we'd love you to come, and let me give you one of my leaflets mode. Anyway, that evening, he did, he did take one of our leaflets, but that evening, I was, uh, I was with a guy called Mike Springer, he was an evangelist within New Frontiers, and, uh, and looked over to the left-hand side, and this man walked into the room with the woman who was on the bed, comatose or asleep or whatever she was, and a whole load of people with her and them came in, and during that evening, each one of those people gave their life to Jesus. Woo! It's a demonstration of the resurrection of Christ. We have a name. Yeah. And it's above every name. Yeah. And what can each one of those people, what happened? A miracle. I mean, Jesus performed miracles because he perceived that people needed to see something. And what did they see? They saw heaven being poured out and a family confirmation that the one who was speaking in that moment is truly God. Can we stand here?